ancient Egyptians, although claimed as ingenious, were merely adaptive. Just like the equally acclaimed Romans and Incas of Peru, these re-inhabitants merely rediscovered the creations of a far older, far more advanced predecessor, who I believe not only constructed these sanctuaries, which these well-studied ancient civilizations merely used to enable the flourishment of their own cultures, in turn, leaving a smorgasbord of architectural artifacts for funded academics to excavate and subsequently parade around, usually bombarding many individuals with deep insights into their lifestyles, culture, and death practices, are yet, as I would have predicted, nearly always absent, that which supports my posit. Any logical explanation or demonstration of how these people built these structures in which they once inhabited like a void in their academic study, one which is not only consistently ignored and concealed by these same academics, but are unknown facts to all of modern humanity to this day. This mystery is a result of the incredible nature of these structures, the precision involved in their constructions, and the enormity of some of the stones used in the building of the structures. Many of you may have seen my recent videos or be a keen follower of my work and, as such, are aware of the fact that due to my in-depth study of the unknowns regarding these sites worldwide and the collection and collaboration of the similarities and differentiabilities I have personally collected and categorized regarding many of these ancient structures, I have personally been able to establish a very strong evidence-based hypothesis regarding the identity of three separate lost civilizations, which I have established using signatures within their style of building, and by default differentiations in their styles of building, to unquestionably identify them as separate yet particular groups responsible for the different unexplainable structures spanning the entire globe. Yet, although these groups have indeed crossed paths, such areas as Aswan Quarry and most significant to my own research in Italy, where the polygonal civilization built upon the Cyclopeans' work, allowing me to establish which preceded which, and although these groups have been established to have abandoned projects midway through, thus indicating that they came to a sudden and untimely demise due to cataclysm, the civilization responsible for the pyramids, and indeed the movement of the blocks at Baalbek in China, which all far exceed 1,000 tons, is yet another civilization which far predated all which I have already identified. These three civilizations are the Polygonal Civilization, the Cyclopean Civilization, and the Neolithic Civilization each with their own unique building techniques and identifiable stone-cutting signatures in their technologies. The pyramid builders were unimaginably more capable than all three, and although the Neoliths, who indeed have created some astonishingly advanced ruins, could have quite possibly been a surviving remnant of this civilization, this digression is for another time. Though at sites such as Baalbek, the Trilithon, which contains stones over 1,000 tons, there are Cyclopean stones built atop the stones, and at other places in the world polygonal masonry has been found, such as Axum in Ethiopia, where the toppled obelisk is said by some to be in excess of 1,000 tons. I have never, and now strongly feel will never, find any indicative evidence of these civilizations building the footings under any of these gigantic megaliths, as they were not responsible for their creation or placement. Additionally, the civilization responsible for the pyramids, and these enormous megalithic blocks elsewhere, were also the civilization who created the false door, a mysterious rock-carved feature also found littering the now-exposed mega-metropolis found beneath the Guatemalan rainforest by penetrative radar. Taikal, part of this metropolis, the place where the plaque illustrating a past global cataclysm was once found, also has pyramids built solely leading to these false doors, with one found in Peru, built into the only rock face containing a very peculiar crystal known for its resonance qualities in amplifying radio waves. I feel that much of the spectacles found in modern Egyptian museums are merely distractions from the really important truths which we should all be focusing on instead. 
such as the true age of the pyramids, structures which, in the past, I have also independently identified as still possessing three separate identifiable stages of attempted casing stones for conservation, each significantly older or younger than each other, with the true exoskeleton of the structures made of stones far in excess of 1,000 tons. Join us next time, where I will expose the controlled opposition within the fringe fields of archaeology, which have stemmed from a growing pursuit for the truth of these facts, with a focus upon the water erosion hypothesis of the Great Sphinx, why it is a misdirection, and the Sphinx's true, original, undeniable identity, facts and truths exposed, which are undoubtedly highly compelling. A number of people who frequent our work have requested a more detailed video regarding one of the mysteries we so often focus upon here on the channel. There are many sites that we feel are deserving of in-depth focus. Our mission has always been to enlighten those who may not have been aware of the many different, compelling, and often controversial realities surrounding countless ancient ruins that throughout their lives have been explained away with a lie. Undoubtedly, the most well-known, most commonly explored, and thus the ruin most suited for our viewers' acquirement of a knowledge armory is Giza. Indeed, there are many people you will meet throughout your life that will have delved into the mysteries of Egypt. However, this experience, unbeknownst to them, may have been fraught with a limited, illogical, academic account regarding the history of Giza's plateau. This video, then, is our gift to our viewer, to prove to all those who act like they know it all how little they actually do. The characteristics of the casing stones are undoubtedly one of our own most noted achievements. We feel little, if any, notice has been given to the facts we have realized regarding these stones, yet the evidence we have found will remain clear for all to see. These casing stones, although of an enormous size, and as such were left by a lost civilization, are far younger than the sandstone in which they encase. Most of these casing stones, unfortunately robbed out during invasions within the last few centuries, are protecting stones which are actually far more eroded and thus far older beneath. However, additionally, we began to wonder just how old could the Great Pyramids be? Could these eroding sandstones actually be concealing a far larger, far older structure beneath? Also discovered here on our channel, the supporting evidence to this hypothesis, most notably along the east side of Khufu and in numerous other places where the smaller sandstones have been robbed out, is, as we suspected, a far larger exoskeleton. We strongly believe these enormous megalithic blocks that we have previously estimated to be many hundreds of tons in weight are actually the original oldest blocks of the pyramids. We also believe that the more modern, currently recognized casing stones were actually inspired by these more heavily eroded smaller sandstone blocks now concealing these mammoth megaliths. This makes the layers we believe that adorn the Great Pyramid numbers three, with the two more modern layers being conservation efforts, undoubtedly undertaken at vastly different times within history. Just how old is the Great Pyramid? Just how impressive was ancient Egypt? For example, the oldest surviving obelisk at Heliopolis, and therefore in Egypt, was undeniably cut transported and lifted into position at an unknown time in history, using now lost technology and knowledge. It is a stone 20 meters in height, weighing an astonishing 121 tons. And this enormous, unexplainable, impossible monolith is not the only one left upon the plateau. There are many more dotted all over Giza. For example, the sarcophagus of Amenemet III a pair of quartzite monoliths, discovered in the early 20th century, hang above this supposed tomb. These gigantic stones effortlessly support the weight above, each estimated to weigh 110 metric tons. The Colossi of Memnon, 
These two gigantic artworks were built from single pieces of stone. They are orientated toward the sunrise at winter solstice, estimated to weigh anywhere from 600 to 1,000 tons each. Modern technology allows for the movement of such weights. However, any civilization claimed by academia, actually once being responsible for the transportation of such stones, is absurd. Who could have possibly transported such enormous stones to these locations? Not only transported them, but work them into masterpieces they once were, disposing of all waste, presumably also weighing many tons. And there are many others. In the temple east of Khafre's pyramid, for example, there lay blocks regularly, yet quietly estimated to weigh over 400 tons. How can modern academia claim such tasks were undertaken by our modern ancestors? Anyone aware of the true accomplishments involved in the construction of the Giza Plateau must now see this hypothesis as severely lacking any satisfactory explanations. Mortuary Temple of Menkara still possesses some astonishing unexplained feats. There are some estimates of the blocks within the temple, most notably within the surviving walls of the mortuary, weighing as much as 220 tons. The heaviest granite ashlars imported from Aswan Quarry many miles away, weighing in at more than 30 tons. There are many incredible, inexplicable features upon the Giza Plateau. Many of them, unfortunately, yet predictably, little shared academically. Yet it remains a place of invaluable existent truths, many discrediting that which are passed off as current academic fact. Giza is an astonishing place and the one we feel most likely to expose academia once and for all. It is a plateau we find highly compelling. Egypt, undoubtedly one of the most controversial places for modern history to try to keep the control of in regards to its origin, its true age, or original builder. When one either visits the Giza Plateau and is lucky enough to gaze upon these three great pyramids, or merely able to peer upon them through their computer screens, the first thing that will usually cross one's mind is awe and amazement. Yet this is often instinctually followed by an air of wonder, a curiosity as to how these miraculous structures were built, who could have possibly built them, and most importantly of all, why. Yet these questions, and indeed the pursuit of their answers, has been a mission for many well-funded deceptive individuals, for many years, to work very hard to distract you from either asking or pursuing as personal line of inquiry. For example, the Golden Mask of King Tut, along with the many other undoubtedly spectacularly valuable artifacts, encrusted with precious metals and jewels that can be seen littering Egypt in its many museums and in the mountains of literature, books, and touring exhibits, which are published, pushed, and permitted in regards to this spectacular area of human history. Grand Egyptian Museum late last month was an exciting event for archaeologists worldwide and a source of pride for Egyptians. We moved today the sixth and the last chariot of King Tutankhamun from the, from the military museum in the citadel, which was there since 1987, to the gem. So we were keen to show you the moving of this uh, very nice artifact and the packing and unpacking uh, method, uh, professional methods you are using by my colleagues in the ministry. The Tutankhamun exhibit, comprising about 5,000 pieces, will display for the first time all of Tutankhamun's artifacts in one place. Experts from around the world have been consulted on how best to preserve and display the collection. When museum workers accidentally knocked off the beard of King Tut's burial mask in 2015 and hastily glued it back on, there were fears that modern chemicals would cause permanent damage to the artifact, but scholars around the world put their heads together to save the golden mask. The museum will also be a venue for international conferences on Egyptology. And there is something new always. We found out today, my cook, the family of Tutankhamun through DNA, how Tutankhamun died. No one murdered him. 
my excavation and the Valley of the Monks that we are doing right now. Important excavation looking for the tomb of Archis in Ammon. Maybe soon a tomb will be revealed in the Valley of the Monks or the West Valley of the Kings. Most of the artifacts in the Tutankhamen exhibit have been relocated from the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. The new home is only about two kilometers away from the place where the young pharaoh's tomb was discovered in 1922. Egyptian officials say the gem will be the world's largest archaeological museum when completed and will hold about 100,000 artifacts in total. We have now 3,000 employees and workmen working inside the project. We are respecting our schedule. We'll be ready from the engineering uh, part by December 2018 and we are deciding now the perfect time or the ideal timing for the partial opening. In addition to King Tut's exhibit, the museum will display objects related to some of the greatest historic Egyptian kings, such as Ramses II, Akhenaten, and Amenhotep III. The ancient... From time to time, we will share with you one of the more intriguing exhibits that can be found within the museums of Giza. Beyond the mountainous displays of precious jewels and finely cast golden relics, which captivate the crowds who flock to experience this extremely rich history, we personally find the more valuable of objects are often overlooked. Indeed, these precious masks and past pharaoh's possessions are undoubtedly exquisite in nature. However, there are some objects, never designed to stun or impress, but built with a function functions which could shed light on the most intriguing and mysterious aspects of this past civilization. The Khufu ship being but one of these said artifacts. A boat found disassembled under the Great Pyramid, one said to have floated through the sky. And although the physical idea of this ship actually flying is a leap too far for some, there is, in fact, an artifact which exists found in 1898 during an excavation of the Padi Ayman tomb in Saqqara, Egypt, which you may find a bit more practically designed for flight through the Egyptian skies. Although numerous sources over the past century have surfaced accusing Egyptian authorities of concealing the discovery of Vimanas, ancient flying machines, within the pyramids of Giza, our said artifact seems to have slipped through this net of secrecy. Often with these well-stocked and well-preserved tombs, resting places of past pharaohs, whom once possessed unimaginable riches, numerous toy models of their once favored crafts and vessels will be discovered, exquisitely constructed miniature replicas of their favorite forms of travel. It seems this artifact may have indeed been filtered through the security netting of public paradigm, as doing so, it seems to have lost its tailplane. Known as the Saqqara bird, it is now largely thought by many to have been a replica of an ancient flying craft, more specifically a glider. Clearly inspired by a bird's flight, the fixed wing upon its back has been found to be perfectly angled to create lift. Egyptian physician, archaeologist, parapsychologist and dowser Khalil Messia has concluded that the ancient Egyptians developed the first aircrafts. Predictably, he has experienced considerable hostility regarding his expose of evidences. One particular effort was undertaken by a character known as Martin Gregory, a builder and designer of free-flight gliders. He apparently built an exact replica of the Saqqara bird made of balsa wood. After testing this replica, Gregory would conclude that the Saqqara bird never flew. He told the interested parties that it was totally unstable in flight. Even after a tailplane was fitted, he claimed that the glider's performance was disappointing. He finished by concluding that the Saqqara bird was probably made as a child's toy or a weather vane. This clear attempt to suppress the truth, however, failed, and Martin has since been proven to have lied regarding the abilities of the glider. The question is why did he lie? According to Messia's son, Dawood Khalil Messia, a successful architect who has thankfully continued the work of his father, Gregory's suggestion that the Saqqara bird was a weather vane is impossible due to the lack of markings or any holes on the model that would serve as a means of hanging it. Additionally, and most importantly, aerodynamics expert Simon Sanderson also tested a replica model in a wind tunnel without a tailplane, and found that it produced four times the glider's own weight and lift. 
In Liverpool University, Sanderson then subjected it to another, more powerful wind tunnel, this time after adding the missing tail. He stated that the Sakara bird actually flew quite well, clearly to the annoyance of certain people who are probably now regretting not seizing the entire artifact some years ago, rather than just the tail plane. Over 2,000 years after the ancient Egyptians carved this mysterious bird, modern technology has proven beyond doubt that at full size, it could have indeed once flown through the Egyptian skies. When one explores the most fascinating and ancient of structures resting all over our planet, you will inevitably be confronted by baffling feats on engineering and ingenuity, tasks that, to modern man, escape understanding or indeed explanation. The main consensus regarding these ancient structures has always been a tricky thing to explain. To claim that these marvelous structures were built by primitive people with only primitive tools at their disposal does not only seem absurd to most who have visited such sites, but ignorant of their true past grandeur and the specific characteristics of each of these places. Ancient sites, such as Giza, Machu Picchu, among many others, still contain very confusing artifacts, anomalous evidence, which tells a very different story to that of mainstream history. Apart from the Baghdad battery, largely claimed to have been an ancient form of electroplating, there has been little in the way of physical evidence to suggest the use of electricity within the academically researched ancient times. Yet, there are many remnants left which suggest such activities. Not only are there countless clear examples of past machine work stone, but most importantly, there is evidence of errors made by these same tools, misstarts and discovered fault lines, these particular stones discarded, laid bare in the quarries, revealing all the hallmarks of the machine engineering that went into building these wonderful places, these artifacts, once rubbish, now historical treasures. They can tell you the shape and movements of the tools that were being used, showing just how these machines cut into the stones, core drillings also discarded during manufacture, and cut stones discarded due to faults and cracks, revealing the complete preliminary cut marks left by the ancient stone cutters. These fragments of past activities are clearly some of the most important in unraveling these sites' ultimate secrets, yet it is rarely shared in the public arena and even less frequently researched by official bodies. Along with this vast and perplexing array of remnants, mercilessly left where they fell, strewn amongst the debris of disruption, lay countless extremely hardy machine stone jars, vessels made from some of the hardest rocks on Earth. Some of these jars were made with a round bottom, perfectly machined, balanced on a base no bigger than the tip of a chicken's egg. Sir William Flinders Petrie ultimately realized that only lathe turning could have produced the symmetry and balance found on thousands of these bowls and vases. And Petrie was no fool. In 1894, he founded his own archaeological body, the Egyptian Research Account, which later became the British School of Archaeology in Egypt. He stated, for example, a bowl maker attained curves of exact circularity by rotating the bowl around a fixed blade and formed a lip by shifting the centering of the bowl. Another round-bottomed vase had walls of such uniform thickness that it balanced perfectly on a curved base. To have a very well-respected researcher and specialist of the ancient Egyptians to admit to a conviction of the use of power tools in these pots construction seems like quite a stunning position to take, especially when one considers that while metal chisels could have been used to shape soft limestone within ancient Egyptian times, the metals that were available to them – copper, bronze, and during the first millennium BCE, wrought iron – were far too soft to work such rock into such exquisite designs. It seems Petri would like to remain honest regarding his conclusions, yet also incomplete with his explanations preferring to let the receiver of said information make their own realizations, preferring to avoid complication by a, by this time, rather visible enemy. One could only conclude that these relics and ancient monuments thereof were not the work of the Egyptians. But further evidence to suggest that these baffling structures were built far before the ancient Egyptians, before academic understandings, 
by a highly technologically advanced pre-cataclysm civilization. We find it difficult to see how such work was undertaken or an explanation for our finding can be made without the use of power tools. Thankfully, the more we learn regarding these enigmatic places, the more we become aware of regarding their true history, and the closer, it seems, we become to finding those who built them.
Hi guys, have you ever heard of Dendera Temple? Known as the sixth gnome of Upper Egypt, it is one of the best preserved ancient temple complexes on earth, and it bears the scars of what must have been the most frightening and destructive of events. An event that is ignored by the majority of modern academia. The complex spans some 40,000 square feet, and within the temple is some of the most well-preserved ancient artworks of anywhere in Egypt. Along with preserving the exquisite art and decorations, the temple also preserved evidence of something we were not taught about in history class. Upon the granite steps, which still lead to the temple's roof, in direct alignment with a small window cut into the thick stone wall, is evidence of severe melting. At one time in the temple's long life, the steps within were turned into liquid magma. What catastrophic event could lead to the melting of granite steps through a small window in the wall? Were such events commonplace, or was it the result of an accident? Is this why the ancient structures were built with such huge blocks of stone? Many have speculated that the Dendora Temple is built upon an even older site. Are the steps surviving remnants of this much earlier complex? Were they part of a structure that once witnessed a solar flare, perhaps, or maybe a localized supernova? Many who have examined the steps and the surrounding area have speculated that nuclear blasts may have been detonated within ancient Egypt, or even before. The ancient site in India, for example, 10 miles west of Jodhpur, with radiation that was so intense the area is still highly dangerous. An ancient layer of radioactive ash was discovered that covers a three square mile area. Scientists investigating the site where a housing development was being built established that there was a very high rate of illnesses in the area. The levels of radiation were so high the Indian government eventually cordoned off the entire area. They later unearthed an ancient city, which shows strong evidence of an atomic blast dating back some 12,000 years, which destroyed most of the buildings and killed an estimated half a million people. Did nuclear war occur in our distant past? Were these ancient structures which have stood the test of time actually built as bunkers? With melted steps and irradiated ancient cities found throughout the world, the evidence is certainly compelling. As always, thanks for watching guys, until next time, take care. The temple also preserved evidence of something we were not taught about in history class. 
Upon the granite steps, which still lead to the temple's roof, in direct alignment with a small window cut into the thick stone wall, is evidence of severe melting. At one time in the temple's long life, the steps within were turned into liquid magma. What catastrophic event could lead to the melting of granite steps through a small window in the wall? Were such events commonplace, or was it the result of an accident? Is this why the ancient structures were built with such huge blocks of stone? Many have speculated that the Dendora Temple is built upon an even older site. Are the steps surviving remnants of this much earlier complex? Were they part of a structure that once witnessed a solar flare, perhaps, or maybe a localized supernova? Many who have examined the steps and the surrounding area have speculated that nuclear blasts may have been detonated within ancient Egypt, or even before.